It was my lot to know Joseph in his boyhood. I was with him in his first mission in 1854. We were numbered with the 20 young elders called to the Sandwich Islands. Joseph was the youngest of the company. When called, he was in his 15th year. But of the 30 men who crossed the desert to Southern California together, there were but five who were believed to be his equals in athletic exercises. Upon reaching San Francisco, President Parley P. Pratt gave Joseph William W. Clough and myself a mission to track the city. At the close of the first day's tracting, Joseph asked to be released. He said, I cannot offer a Book of Mormon without having to listen to a burst of blasphemy and a tirade of falsehood and abuse to my Uncle Joseph, and I cannot be peaceable and hear it. He was released from his tracting. At the time, he was lodging at the home of his Aunt Agnes. She was the wife of his uncle Don Carlos Smith, who died at Nauvoo. And after his death, she married a man by the name of William Pickett, a man whose heart was full of bitterness toward President Brigham Young and the Utah Mormons. And he seemed to delight in slurring them to annoy Joseph. Pickett's home was on a sandy hillside. One day a man came with a load of wood. In passing through the gate, the hind wheel slid down so the hub struck the gate post. Mr. Pickett asked Joseph and the teamster to lift the upper wheel, while he would lift the lower one and slough the wagon back. The upper wheel was lifted, but the lower one was too heavy. Joseph proposed that he try the lower one. Pickett replied, Young man, if you think you are a better man than I, take hold and maybe you will learn something. The wagon passed in and when the man had unloaded and was gone, Joseph faced his uncle and said, Uncle, you seem to enjoy making slurring remarks about Brigham Young and the Utah Mormons. I wish you would not do so any more in my presence. And Mr. Pickett remembered the request. After two months in the harvest field to earn his passage money, Joseph, with the other elders, sailed steerage passage on the bark Yankee for the islands. As soon as the ship was clear from the wharf, the passengers were lined up on the deck and their names were read off to see if there were any stowaways. When the purser called Joseph Smith, the captain asked, Any relation to old Joel Smith? No, sir, was the prompt answer. I never had a relative by that name. But if you had reference to the prophet Joseph Smith, I am proud to say he was my uncle. Oh, I see, said the captain. And he did see a man who had the nerve and manhood to demand that proper respect be shown to the name of the prophet, whom he loved and honored. Within 100 days after landing on the islands, he was preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Hawaiian language. After six months' labor on Maui, he was called to be the president of the Molokai Island Conference. Here he made the acquaintance and won the friendship of a wealthy gentleman by the name of Myers. Stopping by invitation a few days with him, he met Jules Remy, a French savant and author who was making a circuit of the world. With six companions, he visited the wild wonderland of Molokai. The Reverend Mr. Dwight, a Presbyterian pastor of the islands, acting as guide and an interpreter. While all were seated around the supper table, Mr. Remy asked Joseph if the report was true that the Mormon people were in rebellion against the United States. Before Joseph could reply, the parson chipped in, Yes, Brigham Young has always been a traitor. And now he has not only rebelled, but he has ordered his people to massacre all the Gentiles in the territory. Already they have murdered over 100 innocent men, women, and children at a place called Mountain Meadows. 
Joseph sprang from his chair and seizing Mr. Dwight by his collar, lifted him to his feet and said, Brigham Young is not a traitor. The Mormon people are not in rebellion, but you are a liar, and you will take back what you have said, or I will drive your teeth down your throat. Mr. Remy acted the man and came to Joseph's assistance by affirming the question was to Mr. Smith, and that Mr. Dwight was out of place, and that he should apologize, which he did, and from that time on there was at least one Mormon elder that Mr. Dwight treated with respect. In relating these incidents, where Joseph resented the insults and untruthful accusations, I do not want anyone to infer that he was of a quarrelsome disposition, for he was not. In all of my acquaintance with him, I never knew him to be the aggressor, nor to be tantalizing in the least degree. But he was plain and positive. To me, from a boy, he lived in harmony with the Spirit of God, and I have good reason for believing that his father and Uncle Joseph watched over him continuously. And when Joseph was nigh unto death with typhoid fever at President Hammond's on the island of Maui, I feel sure that those two exalted brothers, walking hand in hand, visited and ministered unto him, whereby his life was preserved and he was enabled to complete his earth life mission, leaving on record a testimony of one of the purest lives ever lived by man. In 1864, Apostles Ezra T. Benson, Lorenzo Snow, and Elders Joseph F. Smith, William Clough, and Alma Smith were sent to the islands to put a stop to Mr. Walter Gibson's mischief-making among the Hawaiian saints. This Alma L. Smith is the same whose left hip had been shot away at Hans Mill Massacre in 1838 and restored by the power of God in answer to his mother's prayer of faith. When the ship reached Lahaina, an unsafe harbor, the incoming wave swells were so heavy that the ship had to anchor nearly a mile from the land. Going ashore, the captain invited the elders to ride with him in his boat, but Joseph declined. He was so strongly impressed with the feeling of danger that he pleaded with his brethren to wait until the native boats should come. But the brethren were anxious to be ashore and went. The result, the boat was capsized and Apostle Snow was drowned. And it was a miracle that he was resuscitated and his life saved. In the early days of the Hawaiian mission, our elders met with much opposition and with several severe mobbings. At one time in Honolulu, a crowd of ruffians mobbed the aged president, Philip B. Lewis. The harmless old man was knocked down and dragged by the hills, his head bumping on the cobble rock pavement until the ruffians thought he was dead. Then they flung him into the gutter while they went to a saloon to celebrate the achievement. A carpenter, a new convert to the faith by the name of Burnham, from the roof of a house that he was shingling, saw the last brutal act of the mob and gave the leader a severe thrashing. He whipped the brute so thoroughly that it put an end to the mobbing in Honolulu. The manly fight put up by Burnham endeared him to us, and when we returned to the islands in 1864, we found that Brother Burnham had died leaving the family. Sister Burnham and three children in poverty, homeless. After the apostles had cut Mr. Gibson off from the church, Joseph was appointed president of the mission. With the assistance of elders William W. Clough, Alma L. Smith, Benjamin Clough, and John R. Young, all the islands were visited and the branches reorganized. Then Joseph F. Smith, William W. Clough, and John R. Young were released to return home. At that time, it cost $108 for a ticket from San Francisco to Salt Lake. President Young sent the money necessary to pay our passage home, but Joseph said, I will not go and leave Sister Burnham. It was finally decided to go to the southern route as our money would take us to San Bernardino 
From there, we could in all probability work our way home as Tamesters, while Sister Burnham can find a home with the saints of that place. For a change, we sailed for home cabin passage. Upon arrival at San Francisco, we found a telegram awaiting Joseph, requesting him to come home as soon as possible. Bear in mind, Joseph was an elder, and a financially poor one at that, as his whole life had been in the mission field, and he was the last man on earth to ask for help. What could we do? In council, it was thought best for Joseph and William to go by stage, while I, with the Burnham family, would go by San Bernardino. And now comes the tempter. There were living in San Francisco quite a number of relatives by marriage to the Smith family, and some of them were wealthy. They held a family reunion and invited Joseph to attend. He asked me to accompany him, which I did. We met them at Mr.'s, some twenty all told, six or eight strong, healthy-looking men. A few stories were told, then the conversation drifted into personal experiences and present home conditions. They pitied Joseph and offered to deed him a good home if he would cut loose from the Utah Mormons and stay with them, his true friends. He declined and said if they would excuse him, he would bid them good night. All rose up and then the storm broke. Their spokesman said in substance, Joseph, we are disappointed in you. We thought you were a smith. But any man who will come and go at the command of Brigham Young, the man who connived at the murder of your father and Uncle Joseph, has not a drop of smith's blood in his veins. Joseph said, Do I understand you to say that Brigham Young connived at the murder of the prophet Joseph Smith? Yes, and I can prove the assertion. Then there leaped from Joseph's lips the strongest expression I ever heard come from them. You are a damned infernal liar. Joseph Smith never had a truer friend than Brigham Young. To me, how grand he looked. He seemed to expand until he towered head and shoulders above his opponents, while their faces scowled with anger. Yet like the tempest-tossed waves of the ocean, whose fury had been spent at the foot of the boulder, they recede, leaving the branch cleaner and wider than before the storm. How I loved that man's manliness! He, not a smith, the very tension of the rigid muscles proclaimed him the embodiment of the chivalrous Max and Smiths. And I feel in my being that Joseph F. Smith held the fort and won the victory, giving him a seat with his prophet uncle and his martyred father in the mansions of our Heavenly Father.